Hi, this is a Burlington Pocket Watch. It was listed as a non-runner on eBay, so we'll have some fault finding to do to get this thing back running again. The watch dial and case show some signs of wear, but I think they're in otherwise good condition. Mm. The watch is refusing to wind. Let's test the time setting. Since this is a lever set watch, we'll remove the bezel. Mm, the time setting is jammed as well. Yeah, it's not working. Okay now, so let's just get the hands off and take a peek at the movement. Wow, look how beautiful she is. This is a Getty model, and right away we can see some of its distinguishing features. The beautiful crescent-shaped click and the ratchet wheel sitting solo on the barrel bridge. Okay, testing the motion of the balance wheel. Yeah, it's binding and refuses to oscillate even with the help of some air. Okay, let's continue with the disassembly. The Burlington Watch Company was a mail-order company that used Illinois Movement Soap some people consider them an Illinois private label. Now this watch, the Burlington Special, was its 19 jewel variation manufactured in 1911 and discontinued in 1917. Burlington offered installment plans for as little as $250 a month. Now in case you're wondering, $250 inflation adjusted to 2024 is $81. So these weren't exactly dollar watches. So I'm able to wind the watch with my bench key but it does take a lot of force. And I'm trying to let down the mainspring, but when I nudge the click out of the way, the mainspring isn't releasing. The ratchet wheel moves, but it feels really gummed up. So we'll move on, and we'll probably want to inspect the balance pivot for any obvious defects. In case you were wondering about the uh, little inconvenience on my left hand, I was born this way. As if this hobby wasn't challenging enough. Here we go, let's take a look. Mm, no, looks pretty good. Hmm, well, this is interesting. As I'm moving the pallet fork, the escape wheel wants to move, but it's really sluggish. It's moving in the right direction, but really slowly. See? Yeah, so this is another symptom of a gummed up movement here. Okay, yeah, look at that. The pallet fork is stuck to its bridge, so that explains its sluggish action. Now, inspecting the train of wheels, we can see that it moves okay, but now, wait, wait a sec. Do you see the escape wheel? How it has this sluggish motion at the end, just like the pallet fork? Signs of the caked on gunk are starting to pile up here. Now when buying an eBay non-runner, I like to have the Forrest Gump mentality, the you never know what you're gonna get. But you know, that's what makes this hobby fun. It's like playing detective at a crime scene, piecing the clues together to solve a case. But in our case, it's restoring these amazing timepieces. Okay, oh, that's gross. <laughs> Take a look at all this oil. We'll get that cleaned up, no problem. And now we come to this gorgeous click. Now I rarely come across a barrel bridge where both the barrel and the center wheels are stuck on. And now the winding pinion. So, 
That curved steel piece is the setting plate and it's actuated by the setting lever from the dial side and it engages the time. <laughs> and as I'm saying that, look out one of the hazards of this hobby, flying watch parts. But as I was saying, the setting plate helps to engage a time setting mode. Now let's remove the barrel arbor and we'll remove the mainspring by unwinding it by hand. Now with so many indications of oil, it's a good idea to pre-clean the parts in isopropyl alcohol with a brush. And you know, afterwards, we can load the parts into the cleaning baskets and then it'll be off to the cleaners from there. Now this toy, oops, I, I meant the cleaning machine, isn't necessary, but it does make the hobby fun. And as we see, it does a pretty good job in making the parts nice and shiny too. Okay, let's move on to the assembly. After winding the mainspring into the winder, we press the spring into the barrel, and now we can oil the mainspring. And set the barrel arbor into position. And once it's engaged with the inner coil, we'll lubricate the arbor. Now, when placing the lid on, we have to line up that little notch in the lid with the tab that protrudes out of the tail end of the spring there. Yeah, and now we can press the lid on. So off camera, I've already removed the upper and lower balance jewels and cleaned them in alcohol. And here I'm just reinstalling the upper balance jewels. And now we can move on to the lower balance jewels. Here's another nice to have tool, an automatic oiler. And how this works is that you insert this spring-loaded syringe tip through the hole jewels, and it dispenses a tiny amount of oil onto the cap jewel by pulling on a lever. So I find it helpful to install the balance complete onto the main plate before moving forward. The balance is so often the source of a non-running watch, so I find it easier to diagnose issues in isolation. And a puff of air here, and yeah, the motion looks really nice and healthy. One issue we can address right away is bead error. So as the balance settles down here, that purple jewel hanging between the two gold banking pins should come to rest right in between them. This ensures that the watch ticks and talks at equal intervals. And yeah, that looks good. Now, this bushing. The upper arbor for the winding work sits in this bushing, and over time, the bushing can become oval-shaped due to all the torque and winding forces bearing on it. This causes the winding works to tilt, and I believe this is causing our watch's winding issues. Here's a lateral view. So we see the purple winding pinion meshing with the winding wheels. The ratchet wheel and mainspring barrel are joined by the barrel arbor. The winding work should stand upright on its vertical axis, if the bushing is too wide, the winding works would tilt off its vertical axis, preventing its teeth from meshing with the teeth of the ratchet wheel. And using a domed punch against the flat stump, we can compress the edges of the bushing, resulting in a snug fit around the intermediate, wheel, intermediate winding wheels arbor. But the problem is the bushing is covered by this brass plate, so we'll need to find a way to remove the plate. Enter the staking set. So we'll first use this punch to tap out the brass plate from the top side of the barrel bridge. By tapping against the upper pivot of the arbor, we can push the brass plate out from the top. And here's what's hidden under the brass cover. And we also have a spring that slides onto the intermediate winding wheels arbor. 
so we can see how the intermediate winding wheel slides onto the winding bridge, which appears to be riveted to its brass plate. And I believe this winding bridge is analogous to a typical crown wheel. Time to close the bushing. We use this dome punch and a flat stump. By positioning the barrel bridge between the two, we'll deliver a series of firm taps to the punch. It's an iterative process. You'll want to close the bushing just enough so that the arbor can no longer slide in. But that's okay, because we'll then open the hole slightly with the smoothing brooch. Tap, tap, tap. And we're done. So the smoothing brooch serves two purposes. Not only does it widen the bushing's hole, but it compacts the freshly compressed metal rim of the bushing, work hardening it. You'll want to go slowly though, as it's really easy to open the hole too much. And when you get to that point, of course, you're going to have to reclose the hole. So how do we do? Can you see how there's a lip of metal hugging the arbor in the lower left? Now look at the gap in the arbor to the upper right, pre-closing. So let's test the side shake now. Okay, that's great. There's very little movement. And that's what we'd like to see. We wouldn't want to see the pivot moving back and forth. Yeah, this should fix our problem. Let's finish assembling the winding works here. The intermediate winding wheel spring slides onto the post. And we'll take this and set it into our freshly closed bushing. There. And a little lubrication. Now we can position the winding bridge and press it down slowly. Just a little more. Yeah, and there. Perfect. So, I've mentioned how I love this movement's unique design, but this click spring, not feeling too good about it. I mean, who makes a click spring in this shape? Really? So this spring is installed on the underside of the bridge, whereas the click sits on the top side. But there's another brass cover that we'll need to remove to set the click spring in place. And we can do that through the two holes you see below the spring. Now I'm trying to get an idea of how the spring might interact with the click here. Maybe like this. Yeah, that looks reasonable. Using the same punch we used to push out the setting bridge, we'll drive the brass cover out through the two cutouts from the barrel bridge's top side. And now I'm alternating to the other hole. So I'm sorry, but I didn't capture the installation of the spring. It was a lot more fiddly than I thought, and it took me oh, a solid 30 minutes to get it set properly. Okay, continuing on with the assembly, we get this uh, intermediate setting wheel in place. And there. Wait, no, it's not moving. Ah, okay, I know. I accidentally used the screw for this wheel in the setting lever. No biggie though, we'll just swap screws. And that's the thing with watch parts. They're so small that it's so easy to mistakenly swap screws. Here we go. And there we go. And let's test it out. There, that's much better.
working on the setting pin now. I think it's the first time I've seen one of these. It slides over the intermediate setting wheel and protrudes through the movement side of the bridge. And when actuated, the pin meshes the teeth of the setting wheel with the minute wheel. We can get a better look at the setting pin here. I'm greasing the cutout where we'll install the setting plate, and one end of the setting plate has a small protruding post, which is actuated by the setting lever, and this slides the wedged end of the setting plate under the setting pin. You see the wedge plate there, the wedged end? Yep, it engages the winding mode when it slides under the setting pin. And we'll see this in action a little later, but getting the minute wheel on right now, Okay, when we pull the setting lever, look at the setting pin lifting away from the intermediate setting wheel, and this allows it to rise just enough to mesh with the minute wheel. Almost done with the winding works, lubricating the winding pinion with DX grease. So you know how it's really satisfying when a jigsaw puzzle piece fits perfectly? I mean, the parts are so precise that they really do just fall into place when installed correctly, and it's, it's a really satisfying feeling. Okay, we'll set the mainspring barrel in now. And the rest of the train wheels behind it, that was the fourth wheel. And now the third. And of course, the center wheel, which is also known as the second wheel. Let me know if you know why that is. Let's get the bow bridge down. So we line up the pivots with the holes as best as we can. And then I complete the alignment off camera. Okay, now for the ratchet wheel. But can we just pause here and take a look at how gorgeous the wheel looks? I'm applying some light pressure here while I nudge the click out of the way. And we'll screw this down now. After we get the escape wheel set, we'll place the train wheel bridge on. Now we have to align three pivots. And as before, I do complete this fiddly job off camera. Now one of the bridge screws was missing when I bought this, but I have a replacement on the way. So I hold down the bridge here to prevent the pivots from popping out of their holes while I'm screwing the bridge down. Now, testing that the train of wheels all spin freely, and they do, beautiful. Lowering the pallet fork into position, And now it's bridge. And I'm being really gentle with the pressure here because these pivots are so delicate. And now that they're lined up, let's screw the bridge down. And there. Okay, we're on the home stretch here. It's so nice to see the watch winding smoothly. You see how the arbor's rotating without wobbling? Now compare that with the amount of wobble we had before we closed the bushing. 
Okay, pallet fork snapping back and forth nicely. Now we'll lubricate the pallet fork jewels. This will distribute the lubrication to the teeth of the escape wheel, and it'll really help with the amplitude. It's yet another one of those fiddly tasks. Just a tiny droplet will do. Let's get the balance wheel on. It's what you live for in this hobby. The entire process of fault finding and repairs boils down to this moment. And there you go. Man, that's a beautiful thing to see. You never get tired of seeing it. This could be the first time this watch has ticked in decades. So it's really an amazing feeling to bring it back to life. Okay, so let's get the pivots lubricated. And then we'll throw this on the time grapher. So this dial has certainly seen better days. A nice relaxing bath and denture cleaner should brighten this up. It may sound strange to use denture cleaner, but these dials are made of enamel. And I like to suspend the dial on brass wire coiled around a dowel. I'll let that soak for eight hours. Hmm. So some of the dial markings faded during the bath. My guess is that the dial was touched up with paint at some point. In the future, I'll try pre-testing an inconspicuous part of the dial prior to cleaning. I like cleaning cases in an ultrasonic bath of ammonia. I find that it really does a nice job. Okay, we're almost done. First, let's get the dial back on. So there are three dial feet screws which secure the dial to the movement. Now, we can get the dust ring back on. And now, let's case this thing. So the tip on the old hour hand snapped off at some point, and because this watch is so gorgeous, I just decided to splurge on a new set of blued hands. But the holes on the hands were too tight. We adjust for this by using this hand broaching vise and a brooch. The vise will secure the hand while you turn a brooch to open up the hand's post. So we start off by placing the hand over the hole that best fits its post. And then we can release the top plate which holds the hand in place under spring tension. And once we're satisfied that the post is centered in the hole, we can tighten down the vise. And we'll take one last look at it. Great. Okay, so the brooch is a tapered needle with sharp edges running down its length. By sliding an oil brooch through the hand's post and gently turning it, it shaves material off in the process. We don't want to be too aggressive here as you can shave too much material. 
I repeated this process seven times before the hour hand finally slid on to the hour wheel's post. And here we have it. Okay, time for the minute hand. Incidentally, I had to open up the hole on the minute hand too. Now the seconds hand, great. Okay, now testing to ensure that the watch hands have proper clearances. Yeah, it looks good to me. With such beautiful hands, I had to showcase them with a new glass crystal. Okay, nice. Okay, before we screw on the back cover, let's get one last look at this gorgeous movement. And there we have it. I want to thank you for spending time with me today, and I really hope you enjoyed the process of restoring this antique timepiece. Until next time, be well.